Lesson tonight, this evening, chapter 16. Yochanan, I'll continue in that uh, chapter with that narrative, and we plan to go from just seven verses this evening. That'll be, ch- that'll be verses 12 through 18, and it'll be part 54 of the series. And, of course, Yeshua is going to continue the discourse that he began some time ago. In the final hours of his life here, chapter 16. And in verse 12, <clears throat> what we ended up with is this. Yeshua is saying, I have yet many things to say to you. It, however, it's unachievable to put forth at this point. In other words, he's running out of time. He knows that there's perhaps maybe one or two hours left <clears throat> that he has with his tummy deem before he has to step out and depart and go to that place where he's going to be arrested and where his execution sequence is going to begin. And so at this point, he wants to encapsulate and summarize the most cogent points and instructions for his Tommy Dean that they're going to need after he's gone. They're going to need to understand But Christian scribes after the fourth century and later the Jamesville translators, they needed, they had another agenda. They had something else in mind. And they needed this particular section of text to further bolster and support their own views and their own notions of a Holy Spirit Christianity that they were going to push independent of the Torah. To make sure that Rome would look upon their new religion with favor and make a disconnect, as in fact they did from Jews, Judaism, the Torah, Am Yisrael, or anything else Jewish. And that was the, that was the goal of the early church uh, leaders. They, they said, look, we're going to survive. We need to disconnect our faith from the Jewish people. They're the enemy of Rome. And so the Jamesville crowd comes in verse 13 and gives us this text here that you can see on the board. When he, the Holy Spirit, they have Jesus saying these words, when he, the the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak in his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come. By things have come, of course, MacArthur actually believes (laughs) that this verse has the Holy Spirit pre-authorizing the New Testament as you read it today in English, including its over 30,000 changes and manipulations to the text that Christian scribes did to it. And that's why he doesn't need MacArthur doesn't need to consult the earliest manuscripts because it's all been pre-authorized by his Holy Spirit. Christians, you know, we've learned by now, they have, they have a comeback for everything. They, they have an argument for everything. I, you know, I can't wait until the day when they're finally are put in a position and they, have, they won't have a comeback. Listen to, <laughs> listen to MacArthur here. He's going to actually tell you this, that the New Testament we read today, hey, the Holy Spirit pre-authorized it. Verse 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all truth. The Spirit has been with you in me, and now he will be in you. Jesus says, I'm going, but the Spirit is coming, and he is the same as I am. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. This is the mystery of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Spirit will provide you all the truth you need so that you can prosecute the world. In other words, you're going to be the world's prosecutors. And you're going to have a tool to prosecute them. And it's going to be the revelation that the Spirit of God puts in your hands. He's saying, I'm going to give you the revelation of the Holy Spirit that indicts the world. And the New Testament condemns the world for failure to believe in Jesus Christ. 
<laughs> we use the scripture to prosecute the world. And the Holy Spirit is the author of the scripture. And that's what our Lord is saying here. Here we find out what he thinks about the New Testament, that it is all the product of the Holy Spirit. Wow. It's just an incredibly important portion of scripture. Well say. So you have in these few verses the entire Trinity involved in the revelation of the New Testament. It's an amazing portion of the scripture. Here is our Lord Jesus providing pre-authentication of the as yet unwritten New Testament. He even speaks of it at the end of verse 13. He will disclose to you what is to come. Not all the revelation was done in the Old Testament. There is more to come. So here's our Lord offering a pre-authentication of the New Testament. And it's all tied up in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, you got to hand it to a D. She finds all of these texts, all of these audios, amazing what she finds. And i got to tell you, oh, my God. I got news for you, Mac man. <laughs> the only people who pre-authorized during this New Testament with all its manipulations were your own unscrupulous scribes. What you have here is one messed up translation, believe me. Now, if he wants to go and trust the Greek, if he dares, go ahead. But he has a major problem with the English translation of this verse, of verse 13. Why? Well, let's look at it for a second. In this verse, verse 13, we have a single verse which contains seven verbs. Seven verbs. Six of them are all, listen carefully, six of the seven verbs are all genderless, third person, singular, future tense verbs. And only one of them, the seventh, is a genderless, present tense, neuter, plural verb. Now, got a question for you guys. Think about this and give me an answer on the board on in your chat box. When you, if you go and write seven genderless verbs without gender, not gender specific, what is it that you're trying to say about the nouns or the pronouns that grammatically they're, they're called nominative because they are the subject of the verse? Okay. Whenever you have a noun, whenever you have a verb, it means that there's going to be a subject doing the action of that verb. You have a verb, you got to have a noun that's doing the action of that verb. That noun is called the subject, and it's in the nominative case. Okay, if you go and write seven genderless verbs, then you have to have nouns or pronouns attached to those verbs that are carrying out the action of those verbs. What are you trying to say about those nouns or, tro or pronouns? What, what are you trying to say about them when you use a genderless verb? A thing, not a person. An it, correct. Very good. Iona and Rudy. Because as you know, you have a he, a she, and an it in English. In Greek, it's the same, except he and she, those are genders. And really, neuter is a gender, but it's called genderless, because it's not he and it's not she. So it's an it. Very good. So. You're trying, what you're trying to communicate when you use, when you take a nominative subject and you use, you pair it with a genderless verb, what you're trying to do, that means that the subject of the verse, of noun or pronoun, you're trying to say that it does not have a gender. It's not masculine. It's not feminine. It is neuter. Does everyone get that? I want to make sure everyone's with me, even if you're weak in grammar. D, 
Do you get that? Does everyone give me a yes or no? Do you get you want me to further explain it? It's genderless. You're talking about an it. In other words, the writer does not, does not want the reader to identify the nouns that are doing the action, the nouns or pronouns that are doing the action of the verbs. He does not want them to identify them as a masculine subject or a feminine subject. But guess what? Take a look at Jamesville, at their translation, right on the board now. Let me get it on here. Okay. How many, how many masculine pronoun subjects do you count in this verse? Seven. That's right. I counted seven. Seven he's or his. Well, what's the problem? The problem is that he or his is not a neuter. And yet every verb demands a neuter, gender, genderless noun or pronoun, not a he. And that tells you, Gurotai Rebotai, that whatever this spirit of truth is, in and of itself, it cannot be God. It cannot be part of the Godhead. It has to refer to something close to God, something else. It's not he and not she. And it can't be God himself because God's masculine. It's got to be something connected to God. It can't be God himself. Because God is not genderless. God is a masculine. So let's figure out, as we've done in the past, because this, this, this phrase has come up twice before in 1417 and 1526. To panevma tis alithias. To panevma tis alithias. That's the phrase translated that they translate as the spirit of truth. Now, we already know that topanevma, gone over it many times, is not the spirit with a capital S. It's not the spirit of anything. Instead, topanevma is the point of view, the character, the inspiration, the aura, the inclination, the attitude, the atmosphere, the eagerness the conviction, the frame of mind, the mentality, the enthusiasm for something, the way of thinking, the resolve of something. In this case, the rest of that phrase, that's to panevma. That's the, now the last two words, tis alithias. They say is truth, right? Okay, truth is a simple definition for alithias. But let's see what our Christian lexicons are going to tell us. They're going to tell us that we can actually pick something else. Tis alithias can refer to the symbol of truth, which, of course, every Jew recognizes as what? Torah. Correct. The symbol of truth for any Jew is the Torah. It's just another way of referring to a masculine Torah using a Greek genderless neuter noun or pronoun. Well, this is what Mizmor 119, verse 142, which we've seen before. This is what it says. Take a look. Here's Psalm 119, 142. Tzidkatcha tzedek. Le'olam. V'toratcha emet. Your righteousness is justice forever. And your Torah is emet. Truth. Oh, look at that. 
Look at the word that the LXX uses for emet, alithia. Emet, alithia. Your law is truth. Nomos, susu, uh, uh, su, alithia. Okay? Take a look at, uh, at uh, Malachi 2.6. Torat emet haita befihu. The Torah of truth was in his mouth. Guess what's in the LXX Greek? You can see it over there on the right side. Nomos alithias is in the mouth. Okay? In both cases, the same exact word used in Yochanan uh, 16.13. So obviously Yeshua is referring to the symbol of truth, which he understands, as any Jew would, as the Torah. To benevmatis alithias has to be that point of view, that character, attitude, conviction, mentality, enthusiasm for a way of thinking of the symbol of truth which is, of course, the Torah. Okay, you got that. In every case, these are genderless neuter nouns that are performing the subject of this verb. They're the subject performing the action of the verb of the verbs that are doing these, all these actions that are described in this verse. So instead of a bunch of he's what we're going to end up with is a string of its. Now watch. Look at the beautiful way this comes out now, where we get to take a verse, erase this weird spirit of all kinds of weirdness going on, and all this MacArthur garbage of pre-authentication of the New Testament, and watch now how we can transform this verse into something that is actually making sense to any Jew because it is speaking of our Torah. However, as often as that point of view or character of the symbol of truth, the Torah, might increase or happen or have a portion or make an appearance in this place, it the symbol of truth, the Torah, will teach or instruct you with regard to everything. I'm leaving, but the Torah is going to teach you everything you need. As a matter of fact, you shall not even expound. You shouldn't communicate independently apart from it, apart from the Torah. You could also render it as from himself alone or, from, or on his own. A person should not expound on his own independently from the Torah. In addition to the proportions that you might hear and comprehend in any way that you're going to, to the same proportions that you're going to understand or hear, it, the Torah, shall reveal. It, the Torah, will also declare to you those things that are coming. What a beautiful verse. Here's a verse. Adi loves this one because she's tell, told you many times, our gospel is the Hazinu, found in the 32nd chapter of Dvarim. And what does the Hazinu do? It tells us of the future. It tells us where we're going, where we're heading, what's going to happen to the Jews, the Gentiles in the end of days. What's the plan that God has? It, the Torah, will also declare to you those things that are coming. That's what Yeshua is saying. Isn't that great? What an incredible verse. What an incredible verse. I like it. It's so much more. And it, does, and it goes yeah. perfectly with 12. And it goes with it, right. 
The Holy Ghost is now officially <laughs> retired. He gets to go back with Casper, the friendly ghost. We don't need him in this passage. It's the Torah, not the Holy Ghost. All right, moving on to section, our next section, verses 14 to 15, everybody. Fasten your seatbelts. Here it comes. Here it comes. This is the part where, you know, I threw up these graphics on the end of a messianic lie. The Trinity doctrine, breaking news. The Trinity doctrine is declared fake news. Yep. This is it. <laughs> Folks, if you ever wanted to be convinced or you want to convince somebody else, some staunch Trinitarian, that their doctrine of the deity trinity of Jesus is entirely fabricated in the New Testament, this is it. You can do it right here from these three verses, 14 to 16 in chapter 16. In fact, you can even do it from just one of those three verses. This is going to be groundbreaking. This is huge. This is huge. Trinity doctrine is fake news. Watch how we unpack this. How does Jamesville, first of all, how are they going to present this text? So take a look at 14, right here. Okay. And what do you see? He, we're still stuck on the Holy Spirit. He will glorify me. He will take care of what is mine and declare it to you. And then verse 15, I'm going to bring this one up. And then verse 15, all things that the Father has are mine. And therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare to you. This dribble <laughs> continues with three more genderless neuter verbs in verse 14, of course, Jamesville, being the faithful, honest, true translators they are, illegally attach masculine pronouns once again to all three verbs, just as they did in the previous verse. And in a few minutes, you'll see how we turn those around as well. And then they give us verse 13. And I want you to go ahead again. This time, I want you to go ahead and read on the board, verse 15, I want you to tell me by typing into your chat windows, what do you think this text is trying to get across to you? Verse 15, what do you think? What's the main point? What do these words in English say to you? In other words, what does it say? What does verse 15 say? What's the writer in the English text you're trying to tell you? We're waiting. What is the? What is the? Yeshua obeys the Torah. Yeshua is. No, no. I. Them is going to take Yeshua and give. Take from Yeshua and give to us. Okay. Again, I'm not asking what. I'm not asking what you. I should have put it another way. Not what do you. What do these guys want to try to communicate? Not what does it actually say from a Torah's perspective. What are these guys trying to tell you? Ah, there it is. Ah. Derek's got it. Equal with Hashem. Uh -huh. Yeshua I is the... Eileen has it. Sarah has it. Oh, we God. all have power. Okay, good, good. That's all good. But I think Sarah and, and Eileen are... And Derek, you guys all hit it on the nail. This is a pure, fresh-packed Trinity verse. Whatever God has, I, Jesus, have it too. If it belongs to God, it belongs to me. Nothing that God has, 
Nothing that God is, is absent from me. That's why I just told you that God is going to take that which he is, which is essentially exactly what I am, and he's going to proclaim it to you. You get that? You can't get any more deitized. You can't get any more Trinitarian than that. That's it in a nutshell. And guess what? That's what all the pastors are going to tell you. Take a listen. Now notice what we have in verse 14. He'll glorify me. And for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Now listen to verse 15. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and he'll show it unto you. In other words, and I want to say it very carefully. And so will you hear it very thoughtfully? And it's this. My friend, the Lord Jesus again is making himself equal with God. And all things that the Father hath, they're mine. What the Father is, what he has, they're mine. And he'll take of mine. And that means he'll take the things of God and show them unto you. And he alone can do that. God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Well, there it is. You can't improve on that. Except if you switch churches and head over to Curtis's place and get a sip of his Holy Spirit medicine. <laughs> Take a listen to... Uh, <laughs> he will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. I think this is important. The ultimate teacher is the third person of the Trinity. He gives us things that Christ desires that we know. And this description implies that the Spirit's complete equality with Yeshua and the Godhead. Yeshua is revealing some of the aspects of the mystery of the Trinity here. The unity of God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. He's teaching that the three divine persons have one and the same nature when he says that everything the Father has belongs to the Son. And everything the Son has belongs to the Father. The Bible assumes that the Holy Spirit shares with God an eternal, personal deity. He, along with the Father and the Son, is God. The three persons in one God, who the Christian church describes as the Trinity. One God, existing as three distinct persons, all equally God, all equally eternal, all equally present and active at the same time. God is a Trinity. We've got the Holy Spirit, we're ready. He's given us the Word of God. He's sealed it in inspiration, given it to us in a book. But we just need to pray the Spirit would open our eyes to understand the things that he's given us. Let's pray. Did you catch that? Seriously? He said, he has given us the word and he has sealed it with inspiration. That's what Curtis said. Well, I don't get it. If he, if God has sealed it in inspiration, then how did the Gentiles and the Christian scribes managed to break in, crack the seal, and force over 30,000 changes into the alleged sealed document. He just said they sealed it. So here's the thing with verse 15. You ready for this? This front-loaded Trinity verse. The thing is, it isn't that Verse 15, you know, it's not that verse 15, that the, that the Christian Gentile scribes changed or manipulated some words in this of the Greek text in any way. They didn't do that. They didn't do it here. It's not because of some grammatical issues that you might find in the Greek either. There's no problems with the, with, the, with the Greek grammar here. And it's not because of the English translation either. You know, I got to hand it to them. The English translation is, ah, there's, you know, it could be done a little bit differently, but it stands. No, no. It's far worse than that. The entire verse was manufactured 
from nothing. <laughs> the entire verse does not exist in P66. The entire verse. Take a look. Take a look at what it defined. Look at this. Here you have, and you know, you can already see this page is already badly fragmented, but boy, did we get lucky. I mean, because you can see how, you know, the work that's involved in just trying to figure out what was there. And it turns out that the last word in verse 14 here is the plural dated pronoun imin, and I'm pointing it out here. And that's, you mean means to all of you. And the word right next to it, the very next word that follows, that turns out to be the very first word in verse 16, the singular neuter accusative adjective mikron, for not long from now. Verse 15, virotai virabotai, is one giant fabrication. It was never written at all. It was only added later. But in the earliest manuscript, it isn't there. Of this little, right, I mean, I, I, it's like, of this little piece that we got, we had just enough to show that 15 is gone. Right? God, that's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. The Trinity doctrine can now be officially declared to be fake news. But wait. Let's take a look at the history of what happened here. What happened when verse 15, when was it first added? Because then you're going to see that after it was added, it was then erased. And then it was added again. Perhaps some of you are aware of this thing called the Aryan Controversy. It happened at the turn of the third century of the Common Era, which was a series of Christian theological disputes that arose between two men. And those two men, of course, you know, as these two guys, Arios, Arios, commonly pronounced Arius, who lived in 256 to 336 of the Common Era. And he was a theologian. He was a priest in Alexandria near Cahir, near Cairo in Egypt. And the second guy, Arios is on the right side, on the left, the second guy, his opponent, Athanasius, 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 commonly pronounced Athanasius, Athanasius, who also lived in Alexandria, serving as the 20th bishop of the church there. He was born in 296. He was a little bit, in other words, Arios was older, and he died in 373 of the Common Era. The dispute began in the year 318, and it raged for the next 63 years. Even after the death of both of these guys, it raged on until the first council of Constantinople in the year 381. I'll get back to that in a minute. This Aryan controversy was all about the relationship between God the Father and what they called God the Son. The dispute and the divisions that arose were because the Emperor Constantine wanted to unite all of the Christian sects in his empire and establish a single empirically approved version of the faith during his reign. He didn't want Christians killing each other over this doctrine of the deity of Yeshua. So Constantine convened a council the first council at Nicaea in 323 to put an end to all the disputes. 
which formally adopted in the end the views of Athanasios, or Constantine's empire, which is exactly the views that he happened to favor. Regardless, that was in 323. In 337, Emperor Constantine died. And there was a huge power struggle for control of the empire. In three, and in 353, Constantius, who was Constantine's son, reunited the, 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 the empire under his, under his own rule. But the son, Constantius, unlike the father, he sympathized with the views of Arios, which was still held by many, if not most, or all of the Eastern bishops. Yeah, they said like 250 bishops only attended the Nicaea. Oh, is that right? Yeah, only half. Wow, of them. only half of the known ones. Yeah, nobody wanted this thing. Constantine wanted it, and there were a bunch of empty seats there, you know. And so now Constantius, the son, comes to power, and he likes Arius instead. So he ends up, Constantius, he ends up convening another nine church councils to settle this matter, but he doesn't have any success. Then in 359, the creeds of Arios, essentially representing non-Trinitarian views, won the day, and the Roman world became Arian in 359. Yes? After the Council of Nicaea, after, of Nicaea, mm -hmm. after they approved the creeds of the, you know, what's called the Athanasian Creed, suddenly the whole Roman Empire is non-Trinitarian in 359. But only until Constantius dies two years later in 361, naming his cousin Julian Augustus as his, as his successor. And he's known as Julian the Apostate. Why? Because he became the last non Christian ruler of the Roman Empire. He believed, unlike both his predecessors, that religion should be out of the picture altogether and they should all reunite reunite the entire empire, and it wasn't under Christianity, it was under paganism. He was a pagan, and he liked paganism. He didn't want any church in there. The church suddenly has no longer, has no longer enjoys any state support. But this ruling was short-lived because he ends up dying in the Battle of Samara under mysterious circumstances. In fact, it was reported that he was killed by one of his own soldiers who just happened to be a Christian. <laughs> Julian ends up getting succeeded by the Roman by the Emperor Jovian, who reestablished Christianity's privileged position throughout the empire, and he happens to have favored the views of Athanasios once again, who he reinstates to the highest office as archiepiscopal, and he takes the throne, top guy on the, on the ladder of the church. Still, Jovian recommended moderation to all of the contending factions that he now has in his empire. In other words, he was seeker sensitive. And he got in trouble, <laughs> and he got in trouble for it. <laughs> for all of his moderation, Jovian, while on his way to conduct the funeral of Julian, his predecessor was then found dead in his tent. <laughs> his death, of course, was looked upon with a suspicion, but no one ever investigated it. <laughs> I don't think they wanted to. They didn't know what they were going to find. Next up was Valentinian, and he reigned for the next 11 years. And during his reign, Athanasios dies in 373. The Arian controversy now. Remember, that's still going on. And finally, it gets put to bed once and for all at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 under Emperor Theodosius I, who permanently installs the views 
of Athanasius as law, such that any detectable opposition to the creed of Athanasius is now punishable by death. Ooh, there's some serious motivation to keep your, you not, not become a non-Trinitarian. So with that timeline now understood, let's go back to the days now when the controversy was just getting started just after the turn of the third century. Let's go back to the turn of the third century when this Arian controversy gets started. Now remember, you just saw P66, right? When's P66 dated? P66 is dated to as early as 150 of the Common Era. But what did we find in P66? Verse 15, Yochanan chapter 16, the text is not there. Verse 15 is not there in 150 of the Common Era. But Athanasios wants to solidify his views at the turn of the third century. So he orders his scribes. Athanasios is sitting in Alexandria near Egypt, near, near Cairo, and he, <coughs> he wants to assert his views. So what does he do? He orders his scribes to insert verse 15 into the text. And he probably did this right after he became bishop around the year 314. Okay? Put that on the shelf for a second. Let's jump forward 1,582 years into the future. We're sitting in the 314 Athanasios has just now instructed his scribes to put verse 15 into John's gospel. Let's jump forward 1,582 years into the future. And along come two guys. These two guys right here. Grenfeld. Grenfell and Hunt, okay? And they end up coming to a place called Oxyrinkos. These are two Englishmen. And they start digging in this place called Oxyrinkos, south of Cahir, south of Cairo, in 1896. And guess what they dig up? In the same location... They dig up both P66 for the first time in history, which dates to as early as 150, and they end up unearthing this document called by the Exerian Coast people Papyrus 2484, a.k.a. P5, dating anywhere between 250 and 330 of the Common Era. You can see it here, right? They dig up at the same location, P5. And P5, as I mentioned, guess what? P5, that's the document that Athana... Uh, 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 I pronounce his name. Athanasios ends up telling his scribes to insert verse 15 into that one. Okay? And you can see it right here. You can see it on the British Library. And look at it here. Here's a zoomed up version of 20, 2484. You can see, I've outlined for you, just a few words of verse 15 appear, just a few fragments and I've translated them here for you. But you can see there's verse 14, and verse 15 is in three lines of text, and then there's verse 16. Oh, look at that. Verse 16 is in there. Or verse 15 is in there, right? And now let me show you an even closer zoomed up view so you can make sure that you see this here. Okay, there's a really tight one, right? There's the actual text of verse 15. 
<coughs> in P5. <coughs> so in 150, the text doesn't appear. Suddenly in 300, it does appear, this one. It's and a mirable. It's a mirable. <laughs> and then, oh, wait a minute, watch this. I guess it wasn't sealed up after all. I guess it was <laughs> I guess that one. <laughs> but now watch what happens. The monks who are sitting over in way south of this, way out in the Sinai, in the Sinai Peninsula, they're sitting at the St. Catherine's Monastery. And these monks that are penning Codex Sinaiticus during the same period in 330 of the Common Era, they happen to be part of the group that sides with Arios, not with Athana, uh, 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 Athanasios. So they're, they're the guys that don't believe in the Trinity, and they pin, pin in verse, they don't have verse 15. You don't believe me? Here's Codex Sinaiticus. Bam. <laughs> Look at that. What do they do later after the First Council of Nicaea in 323, the monks are ordered to insert the verse in preparation for the empire's official text, because now they've adopted Athanasios's view. And so what do they do? They pen it into the margins, in the bottom margin in this case. And in all later editions, <coughs> after 450, they pen it in permanently within the text. And verse 15 now becomes a permanent fixture after 450 of the Gospel of John. And that's what you have in the TR and in the NA28. And no one's going to take it out ever, ever again. And I guess that's the work of the Holy Spirit that's been sealed. So there you have it. In 150, no verse 15. In 314, yep, you got verse 15. In 330, nope, disappears again. After 450, whoops, here it comes, comes back. And it's already now 75 years later, and you get the death penalty for not believing in the Trinity. What's wrong? Okay. I don't know. She said something about it being written 1515 somewhere. No, not 1515. Did I make a mistake? I don't know what she's talking about. This one doesn't look wrong. What about your other document? I don't know. Which one are you talking about? Look at the one before it. This one? Yeah. Yeah. You, you 1515. It's not the year 1515. Oh, you're right. I made yeah. a mistake. It say, should say 1615. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. That was Brenda White. It's 1615. Thanks, Thank you, Brenda. 16. It's verse 16. Cha uh, ver no, chapter 16, verse 15. I'll correct it before it goes out tomorrow. Okay? Yeah, it needs to be up at the header, too. Right, right. Oh, is it up there as well? Yeah. Oh, geez. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll correct all those. I'll get that out. You'll have clean. Here, it's correct here. Okay? Thank you. Very good. Very nice, ladies. All right. So do you get what's happening? Now, let's take a look at the text. Let's read 14 through 16 and see what happens to our Trinity now. Because we're going off of P66, verse 14. At that time, you will think of me. Meaning at the time when the Torah comes and is king, you'll think of me. Seeing that out from that which is associated with me, the Torah, it will finally be understood, and to you, it will also teach. Okay? And then, of course, verse 15, whoops, this verse does not appear in P66 or in any prior, any manuscript prior to the mid-third century of the Common Era. So again, since there's a comma here in verse 14, it goes right into verse 16. So let's read it. The Torah will also disclose and teach that truth. And yet, verse 16, just a bit, no longer am I being confronted. And in just a bit, you shall no longer see me. 
Verse 17, his Talmudim then commented amongst themselves, what is this thing? What does, what, is, what does this thing mean that he's telling us? No longer am I being confronted, and in just a bit you shall no longer see me, and that I'm heading off to Ha'av. I'm going off to the Father. What in the world is he talking about? Verse 18. Then they remarked, what exactly is this thing, the in just a bit? They don't get it yet. They don't realize he's an hour, he's an hour two hours away from, from being arrested. We haven't figured it out, what he's talking about. And that's where we end. It's as far as I got this week. Next week, we'll see his answer, verse 19 and forward, and see what's going on. What happened to the Trinity? Yay! Trinity's gone, folks. It's all gone. Well, there we go. That's our lesson. 